So here we have um, a normal ECG trace. Um, here we have the, the P wave, which relates to atrial depolarization, the large QRS complex, which relates to ventricular depolarization, and then the T wave that relates to ventricular repolarization, which is generally positive. Notice that there is no um, way for atrial repolarization uh, that gets swallowed up by the QRS complex. So often when you see an ECG trace, it's written on a graph and on the, the x-axis one millimeter here is one small box it relates to 0 0.04 seconds because it's a graph with time on the x-axis and voltage on the y-axis. And one small square on the, the y-axis relates to 0.1 millivolts. So here's a, a diagram of the electrical um, wires, if you like, of the heart. The SA node is always emitting a electrical pulse that is then picked up by the AV node um, here. And this goes through the, the bundle of Hiss uh, through this junction and then splits into the, the right bundle and the left bundle then go around to supply the, the left and the right ventricles simultaneously which in turn makes the heart muscle contract and pump out blood this is again just to show you what's happening at the p wave this is where there's atrial depolarization then there's a slight delay while it's conducted into the av node then the electrical um, rhythm is passed through the his bundle of his and into the left and right ventricle and that depolarizes the ventricles in the QRS complex. Next there's um, the depolarization that happens in the ventricles and then the repolarization, repolarization that begins which creates the T wave um, and that's the complete electrical cycle in the heart. So to summarize this, the P wave relates to atrial depolarization. The normal time that takes is about 1.2 seconds, which is equivalent to three small squares on the ECG trace, assuming it's going at 20 milliseconds um, on the paper speed. The QRS complex relates to ventricular depolarization. Again, it's the same time as a P wave. It's about 0.12 of a second, three small squares on an ECG trace. The T wave relates to ventricular repolarization. Um, there's no strict criteria for this, um, but you do need to look at the ST segment for changes, whether it's depressed or elevated, whether there's ischemia or infarction. The PR interval, which is measured from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex, should range between 0.12 to 0.121 seconds. That's equivalent to three to five small squares. If it's longer than that, then you've got heart block. So I want to give you a, a stepwise approach to, to looking at an ECG. Um, like any new um, skill that you learn, it's good to have a framework, a system that you can follow, and then you, you're not likely to miss anything as you do it. Again, like um, with many investigations, it's always good to check the patient's uh, name uh, and age and check that you're looking at the right patient's ECG. Uh, also, the, the fact that the male or female and the age that they are will immediately make you think of different types of um, causes for abnormal ECG traces or even what is normal within that, that age range. Then you're going to check the rate. Uh, whether it's normal, fast or slow. Um, we're going to look at that in a second. Check the rhythm, whether in sinus rhythm or not. Check the axis. Is it normal or is it deviated? Is it left axis deviation or right axis deviation or is it in the normal range? I'm going to check the intervals. Um, are they long or short? 
Um, for example, the PR interval is very short. You may have that in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, prolonged in heart block. QRS interval, is it really wide, prolonged again? Is it some bundle branch block going on? The Q2 interval, now this can be prolonged with certain drugs, and this is potentially dangerous, as I mentioned earlier. Six, check for ischemia or infarction. Again, you can look at the ST segment um, of the ECG, or there's depression or elevation. Also, you can marry this up with whether it's Q waves or T wave inversion. And finally, we're going to look at how to look for left ventricular hypertrophy, which is a more complicated skill. So here we have an ECG where we want to check the rate. Is it fast, normal, or slow? So an easy way to do this is to measure the number of big squares, big squares relating to these, the five small squares in a big square. How, what's the distance between the, the top, the peak of the QRS complex to the next QRS complex. And you can count the squares in between. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight and a half. So the R to R wave is eight and a half big boxes. So a simple calculation is to is have the number 300 divided by the number of big boxes, um, assuming that the the paper speed is 20 millimeters per second, and then that gives you the, the beats per minute, which in this calculation is 35 beats per minute. Now, as you're probably aware, uh, anything below 60 beats per minute is what would determine bradycardia. So this is a patient in sinus bradycardia. And what about this ECG? How many big boxes is it between the two R waves in the lower lead two, it's one, two. Again, it's pretty consistent. The next one, one, two. And again, the next one is still one, two. So it's two big boxes uh, between the R R waves, and 300 divided by two is 150. The rate Per minute here is is 150 beats per minute that's tachycardia then we have to ask ourselves is this ventricular or atrial tachycardia and we look at the qrs complex and are they wide or narrow here they are very narrow so this is an atrial tachycardia now if you know something about ecgs a rate of 150 until proven otherwise is a is atrial flutter two to one, atrial flutter two to one. So it's a, a problem with atrial tachycardia. Because it's 150, we assume that basically there are two P waves, which you can't see very easy on this ECG per, um, per QRS. So what is the rate in this ECG? Well, it's roughly one and a half boxes in this part one and a half boxes between the two RRs in the next part of the ECG. So 300 divided by one and a half big boxes is about 200 beats per minute. These QRS complexes um, are broad. So this is a, a problem with the ventricle, the ventricular tachycardia. Um, there's not any obvious P waves. If this is ventricular tachycardia, what do you need to check clinically? Well, we need to check whether there's a pulse. Is the patient having pulseless VT or is there a pulse present? So now we're moving on from rate to rhythm. And when we're looking for rhythm, we're looking to see um, whether somebody's in sinus rhythm or arrhythmia, um, non-sinus. How do you check for that? Well, for every QRS complex, there should be a P wave. And between the, the R to R, it should be regular. And that would be what you normally find with sinus rhythm. So here, you see it's very irregular, the distance between the R-R waves along the ECG. 
can we properly see a P wave? We can't really, it's all uh, a wiggly line. It's not really straight and then a P wave. It's kind of fluttering on the, on the baseline there. There's not any obvious P wave. The QRS complexes are regularly spaced apart. Um, this patient is not in normal sinus rhythm. In fact, they're in what we call atrial fibrillation. So just as for sinus rhythm, you need a P wave and then a QRS. A P wave followed by a QRS. A P wave followed by a QRS. Here, we have a large QRS complex with no P wave before it. This has come early, it's premature. It's what we call a premature ventricular ectopic. Very common, most of us have these every day, um, particularly in young people too. So the next question, question four is, what does this ECG show? Um, again, we can see quite large QRS complexes, but there are different heights. Um, some are very tall, some are smaller. This is what we call polymorphic. Uh, and this is ventricular fibrillation. Um, so what would you do in this situation if you saw this ECG? Well, this is a shockable rhythm. Um, you'd expect no pulse in this patient um, and you want to get an automatic external defibrillator to the patient and shock them as soon as you can. So now we're going to go on to one of the most difficult things of ECGs and that is what is the axis? And what is the average um, um, flow of electrical current in the heart? What direction is it travelling? And is it in the normal position, the normal place? So it moves from a negative to a positive um, movement. And here's a thick arrow uh, moving from the atrial um, atria to the left ventricle. That's the, the main direction of the electrical flow of the current. This is a picture of a um, election night in the UK. And they use something called a swingometer as they could as they have their counts of the votes coming in and they say, oh, it's swinging this way at the moment. This is what it looks like at the moment um, with the politicians. So let's just give you the same idea. What's the average flow of, of current through the heart? Like I say, this is one of the most difficult things in ECGs. Um, don't panic. Here's a cat saying, don't panic, I'm a towel. So to work out the axis, you need a 12 lead ECG. You need to have all your electrodes around the 12 different positions around the body um, to work out your axis. Um, the normal axis can be anywhere between, between lead three to just about ADL in this direction. So in this general direction, and that's still within the normal. Left um, axis deviation is beyond this way, that's that way. A right axis deviation when the, current, the average current goes in this direction is beyond this, this, this area. So normal axis is here, left axis in, in this direction, and right axis deviation in, in the electrical flow is in this area, this quarter. Notice, for example, lead one is more positive, so it's more this direction, this side, rather than being negative, so rather than that way. Okay, um, lead two, again, is generally more positive, and it's going this direction rather than uh, the more negative opposite that way. Okay, so that tells you which flow of the current. So again, just what I just said, um, the axis can be ranging from minus 30 to 120. That's normal. Um, if the QRS in leads one, in lead one, and AVF are positive, the axis is normal because then it's between those two. It's in this direction. They're both positive. Okay. So a quick look at the axis is to use leads one, two, and three. And where is the QRS complex more positive? So it's more positive in lead one. Okay. So it's more positive in this in this direction over here. It's then. Um, Again, a bit more positive in two than it is in three, so then it's it's more likely to be 
there than it is um, in this direction. So it's kind of more between those two. It's, that's the, the axis between the lead one, two. So where is it more positive? It's more positive one and two than it is three. So the axis is around here. Uh, left axis deviation. Um, this time you're looking at um, lead two and it's quite negative. Um, so lead two is in this direction. It's more negative. Now it's still quite positive in lead one. So it's still in that, that area. Um, and AVF is again negative. So it's in that, that, that formation. So it's, it's around here is the axis. It's deviated from the normal area. Right, axis deviation. Well, you've got a positive in lead three, so it's in this direction. It's negative in, in one, so it's more in this direction. And it's negative in AVL. So AVL is this way, and that's more this direction here. So it's, it's deviated in a right axis, away from the normal axis. So in summary, if the QRS complex in these one and AV, AVF are positive, then the axis is normal. But if lead one is positive and the AVF is negative, it's likely that it's left axis deviation. If lead one is negative and AVF is positive, it's likely you've got right axis deviation. So that's a quick summary a quick way of looking for axis. Now, I'm not expecting you to know this, but it's just to give you information and to inform you how the steps of looking at an ECG are. And now we're going to move on to step five, which is checking intervals. The first interval is looking at the PR interval, which is the start of the P wave um, to the, the start of the QRS complex. And that usually measures three to five small squares, which is equivalent to 0.12 to 0.2 of a second. The QRS complex relates to the start of the QRS to the um, end, which is start the Q wave story to the end of the S wave, um, and that's about two and a half to three small squares, which is about 0.12 of a second. Now the QT interval is the measuring of the, the start of the Q wave to the end of the T wave, um, and grossly, it's half the RR distance, depending on the heart rate. So it's about 11 small squares. We'll come to why that's important in a minute. So if you get a short PR interval, where basically it's, it's going through the AV nodes very quickly, you normally get a delay, um, then you have um, a very short PR interval. Um, and you get this delta wave, so it kind of takes off, uh, like in the diagram on the right here. Um, and yeah, you, you usually see a P wave, but it's very closely next to the QRS complex, uh, and you get a tachycardia. Here you've got about three squares between the RR, which is about um, 100 beats per minute. If the opposite happens, where you've got a prolonged PR interval, as in a block, there's something blocking the electrical current getting through, usually like a, with the AV node, then um, if it's the same distance between the PR interval every time, as it is in the top diagram, um, it's seven small squares as opposed to five small squares or less, um, then that's called first degree heart block. If you get an increase of the um, PR interval as it goes along the rhythm strip as here, then eventually the QRS complex will be dropped from the P, P wave. So here you've got increasing length between the, um, the distance of the PR interval um, and the, the pulse will go something like dum, 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 drop a beat and then it'll carry on again. So the, the, the spacing of the pulse will be increased as well as you check it. Other types of second degree heart block uh, include MOBITS 2, so it's a fixed PR interval 
Um, so the P, P wave comes at the same time every time, um, but the QRS complex is sometimes dropped. Um, that's a maybe it's type two. The third degree heart block is there's no association between the P and the QRS complex. Uh, they're completely random and there's no obvious pattern um, to when a QRS comes in and that's complete heart block and that's worrying and that pa patient needs a pacemaker as soon as possible. The next interval we're looking at is the QRS. Now that's usually in um, right or left bundle branch block. Um, this is small print but it's just to let you know. Um, so you get an RSR pattern um, this RSR pattern in V1, and then you get a QRS in, um, in V6 in the right bundle branch. In the left bundle branch, you get a, a deep um, R, you get a small little R, and then a deep S, um, and then you get this like M shape for the um, for the in V6, the, the Moro sign as they call it, M for Moro. Um, and uh, these are different causes for right and left bundle branch block. I'm not expecting you to know this, but this is just for completeness. And here we have the, the thing I want to talk about is the prolonged QR, QT interval. Um, it's more than half the RR distance between the two RR waves, um, and so it's prolonged. And this is a risk factor for faints, blackouts, and sudden death. And it's associated with some drugs, um, even common drugs like antihistamines, some antibiotics, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, other depressants, antidepressants, and even antipsychotics. All common in Jordan, and a lot of them just given by the pharmacist to patients. So be aware um, that these drugs can prolong the QTR interval, which um, in turn is a risk for faints, blackouts, and sudden death. So this is a, a classical progression of uh, an MI um, and the, in the ECG changes that happens. Um, first of all, in the first few minutes, you get this peaking of the, Q, of the T wave. Then in minutes to hours after the event, you get the ST elevation. See how elevated it is above the baseline here. Um, and that's ST elevation, classical um, acute coronary heart attack. Then you lose the, the R wave and you get the beginning of the Q wave forming after hours to days. Then you get T wave inversion, the opposite way around than it normally is after a few days. And then often after days, weeks and months, you get the normalization of the, the, the T wave back to normal, but you're left with this Q wave often. That's the classical um, picture of MI and how the waves progress in the ST segment uh, and what happens with the, the FT wave and the Q waves that form. So next I want to say which leads relate to which part of the heart. Well, as it shows here in this diagram, in blue, the lateral leads um, correspond to V5, V6 and lead one. The inferior leads uh, refer to leads two, three and AVF. And the interior leads V1 um, to V4, often people include V5 and V6 as well. Well, why is that important? Well, it relates to the arteries and which artery is, is corresponds to which um, part of the ECG. So this is a diagram of um, the coronary arteries. Um, here you've got um, basically the inferior um, leads relate to the right coronary artery. Uh, anterior wall relates to the left ascending descending artery. That's V1 to, to V4. The lateral um, corresponds to um, leads 1, V5, and V6. Um, and that more relates to uh, this area over here, the lateral wall. Uh, and that's more the circumflex artery. So let's look at some ST segment changes. Here we've got normal, 
and you compare that with ST depression going on here. So you see it's it's below the baseline as as you get in the normal trace. It's ST um, depression and that is classical in myocardial ischemia, particularly if someone's uh, doing a treadmill test, so you might see ischemia arising, you can get chest pain after doing several minutes of exercise. Or it can also occur in a non um, ST elevated MI, so just be aware of that. Most MIs present as a STEMI, we get ST elevation. See that on this um, on this graph here, how elevated it is above the, the baseline, it's at least three to four squares above. Um, it's what we call tombstoning. This is a classical British, I suppose, tombstone. You get that shape. Um, and so the criteria, if you want to be strict about it, is at least one small square in two subsequent leads in 2, 3 and ABF. Remember, that's the theory leads or one and AVL, which is the lateral leads. Or if you look at the anterior leads, it's got to be two small squares, a bit more elevation and the anterior leads between V2 and V6, or a new left bundle branch block. And now we're going to move on to just the last step in an ECG is looking for left ventricular hypertrophy. And this is just for your information. I'm not expecting you to know this, but it's just to say uh, these are the tips for helping you work out whether a patient has left ventricular hypertrophy, often from hypertension, or it could be part of the um, congestive cardiac failure that a patient's developed. So, the simplified criteria is the deepest S wave in V1 or V2 plus the tallest R wave in lead 5 and V6. If that measures to more or equal to 35 squares and or the R in lead AVL is, is greater than 12, um, then, then basically you meet the criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. In a patient that is over equal to 35 years old, and there may also be left ventricular strain. Okay, so basically in this diagram, you've got 20 squares, small squares of in V1, um, as opposed to 14 in V2. So you take the bigger of the two, that's the 20. Um, Add that to the tallest R wave in V5 and V6, and that's in V5, it's got 23 small squares. Um, that gives you a grand total of 43, which is over 35. Um, and so that meets your criteria, assuming this patient's over 35. I don't see any um, left strain pattern. Often you get um, depression, ST depression in, V5 and V6, but I don't see that in this case.